So good morning. Happy second to last Friday of the term, right? Uh, so um, I just have a couple of announcements to make, if you don't mind. Ladies, thank you. Um, so quiz five, I know it says on the um, schedule that quiz five is today. Um, it's not today. It's going to be next week. Okay, so we'll do it next week, uh, next Wednesday. For you online people, it'll probably be from Wednesday to Friday that you'll be able to take it, okay? So it'll be opening up on Wednesday. Um, I also want to mention, of course, the final is the Wednesday after next Wednesday, okay? If you're going to take the final with me in class. Um, so what I think I'm going to do is, Inez, I'm going to get Inez to help me out with the final. Do you have time during that time? Okay, so okay, so um, I'll split you guys up into two rooms, and we'll do it on basis of last name. Okay, so you'll know prior to um, the exam where you're to take it. Okay, that way we can spread out. You know, um, I'm in, I'm expecting more people for this exam than I have been for the other exams, so I want to make sure um, everybody has ample opportunity to feel comfortable. Okay. So um, I'll be sending you out an email about that once I learn what room I'm able to um, also use. Okay, so half of you will be in this room and half of you will be in another room. Probably one of the rooms like uh, down on the other end in the, the uh, newer part of the building, like 119 or something like that. But um, just wait for the email and I'll send it to you. Um, remember, four by six cards. Uh, you can use a 4x6 card for the final, um, but it can only be written in your handwriting. Um, in order for me to be able to go over all of the 4x6 cards um, to make sure everybody did it the right way and uh, be able to distribute them to the various places where people are going to be taking the test, the testing center, or to me or Inez, I'm going to need to uh, see them uh, prior to the exam, obviously. Um, so what I'll have you do is turn them in the, that Friday, so 12-10, which is a week from today, okay? So if I don't have it by that day, then you won't be able to use a 4x6 card on the final. So don't show up with a 4x6 card expecting that you'll be able to use it, okay? What will happen is I'll sit you guys all down, and then I'll just call out your names and redistribute your 4x6 cards, okay? Or if you go to the testing center, obviously, when you walk in, they'll give you your 4x6 card when um, you're about to take your test. If there's something wrong with your 4x6 card, okay? I'm not going to send everybody an individual email explaining as to why their 4x6 card doesn't work. Just follow the rules and you'll be able to do it, okay? You'll be able to use it. If your 4x6 card is not the way that I've prescribed it, okay, you won't be able to use it. So you'll just come into the final and you'll be like, I don't have a 4x6 card, okay? So make sure that you um, do it the proper way, okay? Um, let's see. Lab final. Remember, there's a lab final, okay? So you're going to need uh, one of those blue scantrons, okay? So not this kind of scantrons, but the other kind of scantrons. I think you can get them in next to Subway in the... Yeah, yeah, so Molly, Molly too, okay? Yeah, well, try to make it the blue one, okay? I think they only cost like 70 cents or something. That thing, yeah, the gray one or whatever it's called. Huh? Yes, the front and the back. Here, can I see that, Jane? Do you mind? Okay, this is the uh, Scantron that I was referring to. Okay. Huh? Yeah, I don't know what he's doing with the whole thing. He'll probably be using a similar exam to us, too, though. What number? The AccuScan number 
28040. Okay. So are there any questions about any of this stuff? Remember, if you're on the on in the online class, you have to email me prior to me um, allowing you to take the test with us in class, okay? Okay, so I think that's everything for announcements. Um, I think we, well, I think we finished this slide uh, last time, but uh, if you recall, we were talking about alkanes and alkanes are the simplest form of hydrocarbons. They only have sigma bonds in them, no pi bonds, no other functional groups, no heteroatoms, okay? Um, here are a variety of structures of hydrocarbons. Remember, this is known as an unbranched hydrocarbon here. This is a branched, a branched. This is a cyclical or cyclic um, alkane, right? A cycloalkane. This is also a cycloalkane. Uh, remember, you're going to have to know the first 10 alkanes, the names of the first 10 alkanes. But uh, you remember, hopefully, that uh, little phrase that I gave you to remember the first four, right? Mice eat peanut butter, yeah. So methyl, ethyl, propyl, butyl. And all the rest are, like we were saying, just the Latin names of the numbers, pentane, hexane, heptane, octane, nonane, and decane, okay? Uh, it's good to know those because a lot of times uh, there'll be um, groups that are coming off, is that yours? Yeah. Um, com coming off of a different molecule, right? Like, let's for example just draw a particular molecule. I don't know. We'll just draw a cyclohexane um, with one of these groups coming off. So if we look, right, this is a cyclohexane, but it's got a one, two, three carbon chain coming off of it. Does everybody see that? There's three carbons. So what we would say is that's a propyl group, okay, a propyl group. Propyl group, like that. And if there was four carbons on it, we call it a butyl group, okay? If there were five carbons, we call it a pentyl group, okay? If there were six, we'd call it a hexyl, okay? Uh, just this, this part is what we're talking about, okay? With three carbons, it was a propyl. Now that we've changed it to four carbons, it's a butyl, yeah. Right? And remember, this butyl is referring to just the regular alkane of four carbons, which is butane. Notice the end here. This tells you what type of molecule it is, okay? So if you ever see something that says ane like that, you, you, you can usually um, guess that it'll be an alkane. Uh, alkenes a lot of times will end in ene, okay? Um, alkynes will end in ine, okay? And this suffix il, like here, il, uh, means that it's sticking on something else, okay? Okay, so hopefully everybody's cool with that list. If not, study it up. And here you go. This is what I was referring to, right? So this is methane here, CH4, but if we got a CH3 group sticking off of a molecule, we call it a methyl group, okay? Ethane here is this two carbon chain. If we got a two carbon chain sticking off a molecule, we call it an ethyl group, okay? So I think this was the last slide we really kind of touched on last time was uh, the correlation between number of carbons in your carbon chain of your alkane uh, and relating that to the boiling point of the alkane, okay? So if we look here, uh, on the x-axis down here we have number of carbons that increases incrementally by one, okay? Um, 
and notice the boiling point is here on the y-axis. So if we have a carbon chain of one, which is methane, right, CH4, uh, we notice its boiling point is somewhere around negative 180 degrees Celsius. Okay, when we increase that carbon chain to two, or ethane, it increases the boiling point, okay, to about negative 100. Then three increases it again, four increases it again, five increases it again, six increases it again. This is the general trend, okay? The higher number of carbons in your chain, or in other words, the higher molecular weight of your alkane, the higher the boiling point is, okay? So it's just like my analogy that I always use with the tennis ball and the bowling ball, right? So the heavier of those two items is harder to break away and to go into the gas phase or throw it up in the air, if you will, okay? So if you have lighter things, they're easier to break away and go into the gas phase just because they don't need as much energy to do it, okay? So, and again, notice here, all right, once you get to a certain number, uh, five, as a matter of fact, pentane, uh, room temperature is this dashed line. So at room temperature, pentane is a liquid, right? And in fact, all of the hydrocarbons above that uh, number five are going to be liquid until you get up to the way high numbers and those will be solids, okay? Um, so we've talked about different types of isomers uh, in relation to like alkenes where we talked about cis and trans geometric isomers. We've also talked about structural isomers where two molecules have the same structure um, or sorry, same uh, molecular formula but different structures. We call those structural isomers. We're going to now talk about another type of isomer called conformational isomers. So you're going to be asked to identify whether, probably compare or identify whether this is a geometric isomer, a uh, conformational isomer, or a uh, structural isomer, okay? So um, this molecule that we have up here, this is butane. Notice it's one, two, three, four carbons in the carbon chain. Hopefully everybody sees that. And it's a saturated hydrocarbon, okay? So the only saturated hydrocarbon that has four carbons in its chain is butane, okay? So if we look here, hopefully you see this model that I've created is the same structure as what's indicated on the left-hand box there, okay? So notice I have four carbons in my chain there. Does everybody see I have four carbons in my chain? Okay. So if you look at that in relation to this, so the only difference between this and that up there is they're showing it to us kind of at this angle, like that, okay? So you guys see that, how it's in relation to what we're seeing here? Notice both of the methyl groups here and here, right, both the CH groups, the methyl groups, are pointing up in this drawing up here, okay? Notice here, this is the same molecule, okay? This is also butane, right? If we look at the carbon chain, one, two, three, four, right? There's four carbons in that carbon chain, and all of those carbons are saturated with hydrogens, okay? So it's a saturated hydrocarbon with four carbons. Clearly, the only structure that that can uh, be is butane. The only difference between these structures is, notice this methyl group's over here to the right, okay? So let's build this model to make it look like that second structure. So all I have to do is take it and turn it like that, okay? Hopefully everybody can see that the structure on the right is this same structure that we're showing right here, okay? So what have I done to this molecule? Well, it's the same molecule 
all I've done is rotated it around one of its sigma bonds, okay? So conformational isomers are the same thing, they're just in different conformations, okay? If you know what a conformation is, it's like a different way of, um, you know, moving or putting your, you know, parts, okay? So, like, in other words, a conformational isomer of me, right, like standing like this, would be me standing like this, or me standing like this, okay? Or me standing like this, okay? So, conformational isomers of butane would be like this, like this, like this, like this, like this. They're all the same molecule, they're just rotating differently in space, okay? So, in fact, what you find, why do we care, right? Because um, these molecules would rather be in what would be the most favorable conformation, like the little Charlie Brown uh, looking bond line structures. Why is that? Because when they're in what we would might, might think of as like the cis structure, as opposed to the trans structure, if you want to go there, um, these things, these two methyl groups, can bump into each other here, okay? So they don't like to bump into each other, so what they'd prefer to do is be arranged in this sort of fashion, which is why we draw everything like this, okay? Because that's this sort of arrangement, okay? So, if we looked at these two things, they're the same molecule. The only thing we've done is taken this and rotated it like that, okay? So, same molecule, right? Taken this, rotated it like that. Cool? Um, and there you go, you can see the pictures of the two models we just built, okay? And how they are arranged differently in space. Okay, cycloalkanes, I know we talked about them briefly already, but again, hopefully you can tell that if we draw this little triangle here, it correlates to this structure here. CH2, 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 all connected by sigma bonds. If we draw a little box, that means we're drawing this structure here. Notice the names of these molecules. This is called cyclopropane. Why do you think it's called cyclopropane? Because it has three carbon atoms, right? So that's where that name comes from. Cyclopropane, cyclobutane, cyclopentane, and cyclohexane. Okay? So this is a very, very common structure you'll see, cyclohexane. So I'd get somewhat familiar with it just if you see that kind of hexagon uh, just know that it's going to be um, cyclohexane. Okay. So, let's talk about um, some geometric isomers. So remember, geometric isomers were like the cis-trans isomers. So do you remember, with the cis-trans isomers, the reason why those molecules were isomers of each other, or they... Here, let's just draw the two molecules that we're referring to. So when I'm referring to this and this, right, they're, um, they have the same molecular formula, uh, but their atoms are arranged in space differently right? They have the same connectivity. Their atoms are arranged in space differently. These are known as geometric isomers, okay? One of them cis, one of them's trans, right? Why can this one, why aren't these um, conformational isomers? You remember conformational isomers are just things that can rotate around and rotate around, right? And get to 
uh, the same structure. Why can't I go back and forth from these two structures to get to each other? The double bond, right? So that double bond um, doesn't allow free rotation around uh, that, uh, in between those two carbon atoms. Therefore, we can't go back and forth between those two structures like we could between these structures here, right? So this is butane, that's butane, right? So these we call conformational isomers. And these we call geometric isomers. Remember, it's because we can't do that, right? We can't rotate around that bond. But here, rotation around that bond is permitted, okay? So, in other words, these are the same structure, or the same molecule, I guess I should say. These are different molecules, okay? Same thing goes with cyclic alkanes, okay? So let's build a cyclic alkane and prove, or at least understand, what I'm trying to refer to right now. Okay, so notice here I have the cyclohexane structure, right? Six, small, six uh, carbon atoms, so that's hexane, right? It's in a circle, right? So we call it cyclohexane, okay? Um, notice I have these two green atoms, these two chlorine atoms on the one side here of cyclohexane, okay? We actually call this this, okay, because they're on the same side, okay, just like the geometric isomers we call cis. Okay, can we um, rotate around this bond and make the transversion, right? So in a regular alkane, we can rotate around that bond, right, and go back between the two isomers, right? But in a cyclic alkane, I actually have to break the bonds and move them. Why is that? Why can't I go back and forth? Because, right, there's no free rotation because it's in this cyclic structure, okay? So I'm going to let you guys play with this and hopefully you want, will try to get it to having those chlorines both on either the bottom side or the top side of this, okay? And hopefully you'll be able to see that you can't do that, okay? So in fact, in cyclic alkanes, there's um, the type of isomerization, geometric isomerization that you see in alkenes because there's no free rotation around that sigma bond. Normally around sigma bonds, you have free rotation. But here you can see similar pattern of geometric isomerization occurring in this cyclopentane structure. Here we have the methyls on the bottom of the ring, right? And here we have the methyls, one on the bottom and one on the top. You can't go back and forth in between those two structures. So they're both their own unique structure. They're their own unique compound, okay? They have different properties from each other. Um, so uh, we refer to them just like we refer to the alkenes as cis and trans, okay? 
So like this one here, if you don't mind for a second, this would be known as the transversion, right? Because the green atoms are on the top and on the bottom. If I were to change this to this structure, This is the cis version, okay? So geometric isomerization doesn't only happen in alkenes, but you see it also in cycloalkanes. Okay, so let's talk about some properties of alkanes fairly quickly. These are all nonpolar molecules with very weak intermolecular forces. They don't like to um, kind of interact with each other very much. They're not soluble in water. Um, in fact, I'm going to give you a new term, uh, hydrophobic, okay? So when things aren't soluble in water, you call them hydrophobic, right? Phobi phobic like phobia, right? Like being afraid of. Hydro like water. Okay, so a hydrophobic molecule is like afraid of water. Okay, so it doesn't like to be around water. The other type of molecule, the ones that like to be in water or will dissolve readily in water, we call those hydrophilic molecules. Like philic, like in love with. Okay, so there are some molecules that are hydrophilic which can dissolve readily in water others which are hydrophobic which don't dissolve at all in water um, alkanes have a very low density less dense than water that's why when you mix alkane solutions with water the alkane will um, float on the top of the water because they're less dense than water um, melting points and boiling points increase with molecular size. And if you can see this picture, you can see the little oil droplets floating on the water representing the density difference. Okay, so some properties of alkanes. These are the least reactive or of organic compounds. All or other organic compounds react much more readily. Although we do use alkanes quite significantly in combustion reactions. So like um, the propane, yeah, you like that? That picture is awesome, huh? <laughs> the propane that this gentleman is using to grill his hamburgers uh, is an alkane. Uh, lighter fluid is an alkane. Um, a lot of things, gasoline is a mixture of alkanes, um, methane, of course, what we use in the Bunsen burner and to um, heat our homes is also an alkane. So all of these reactions are combustion reactions. This is the main reaction that you find alkanes um, uh, doing. Okay. So let's talk about aromatic compounds. Aromatic compounds, so we're just doing a survey of all of the different functional groups right now, right? So aromatic compounds look a lot like alkenes, okay? So hopefully you guys can see the similarities between alkenes and aromatic compounds already, right? So if we look at this compound here, this is benzene, if you guys have ever heard of that molecule, um, one of the most stable molecules. Um, organic molecules, which is why it's so carcinogenic, as a matter of fact. Um, but anyways, aromatic compounds, you can see, so this is the bond line form of benzene, right? And this is the um, Lewis structure of it. Okay, so hopefully you guys can convert back and forth by now. So remember, what does an alkene have? What's an alkene's functional group? Does anybody remember what the alkene's functional group is? Why does the benzene look like an alkene? Because it has a double bond, right? So what's the alkene's functional group again? Double bond, okay? So if you don't know that, then you should probably be thinking about functional groups instead of the other things you're thinking about, okay? So here, 
you can see how many? You can see three double bonds there, right? But notice, we don't call this an alkene. That's weird, right? We would think that you'd call this an alkene. But, in fact, when you've got um, alternating double and single bonds, that gives different properties to these types of molecules, okay? So, in other words, aromatic compounds contain a ring-type structure that has alternating double and single bonds. Okay. So, you're going to be asked to recognize these. Okay. So, an aromatic compound contain a benzene ring or a derivative of benzene. So you'll be looking for this type of a structure. Okay, if you see that, then it's aromatic. There's another... So anything that... Any other compound that's not aromatic, we call... We give another name to. It's called aliphatic. So all those other compounds that we've learned before aromatics, those are all aliphatic compounds. Anything we learn after aromatics, they're called aliphatic compounds, okay? So aromatic structures are very, very a unique structure, okay? So that's why we uh, have broken them up into their own division, okay? So there's benzene, right? So you can imagine drawing it like this or like this. They're equivalent structures, okay? And as a matter of fact, um, a lot of times you'll see benzene drawn because, in fact, neither one, this one or this one, correctly represents what benzene looks like. In fact, it's a hybrid between these two structures. And a lot of times you'll see people just draw it like this. Okay? So with a, it's like a cyclohexane with a circle in the middle. Um, these are known as Kekulé structures, and that's just after some dead guy, okay? Some dead guy's name was Kekulé. He w was the first guy who thought of benzene uh, being like this, alternating double and single bonds. He had a, a crazy dream, apparently. He was thinking about this his whole life. And one night, he woke up in a cold sweat, like, screaming because... Uh, he was having dreams of a snake chasing its tail around and around and around and around. And he realized that that was the, you know, deduction that he needed to come up with this um, structure of benzene. Before this, uh, benzene structure was very highly debated. Okay, he came up with this one night while he was asleep. Um, that's why um, so much... Uh, praise is given to him by these structures. Okay, so here you can see some benzene derivatives. Right, so these are all aromatic compounds. Hopefully you can see the aromatic portion of the compound. Notice the name here, ethyl benzene. Why do you think it's called ethyl there? Because it's got that two-carbon chain off of it, right? Anything with a two-carbon chain is called an ethyl group, right? Okay, so there's some other ones. What do you think this group is called here? Nitro group, right? So you ever heard of nitro, right? Grand Theft Auto or whatever, right? Uh, that's what you're putting in your car. Uh, you ever heard of TNT? TNT, trinitroglycerin. Um, notice this group here. C6H5. Okay, C6H6 is benzene's molecular formula. Whenever you see this C6H5 hanging off of something. That's saying there's a benzene ring hanging off of that, okay? So this is another way to write it, C6H5. So in other words, instead of writing this structure here, 
I could have just put C6H5 there, and I would have expected you to realize that that's benzene. Okay? So, in other words, there's two coming off of that same carbon right there. Let's draw that structure up there. So that's the cyclobutane structure, right? Everybody hopefully can see that. So that's what that structure looks like. In aromatic compounds, we also have structural isomers, okay? These are um, molecules that have the same uh, molecular formula, but the atoms are arranged differently in space, okay? Notice here, we've got these three dibromobenzene derivatives, okay? Here, we have the bromines on these two carbons. Here we have the bromines on these two carbons. So here there's no carbon separating them. Here there's one carbon separating them. Here there's two carbon separating them. Okay? Um, the different structural isomers, if you're in the one, two positions or positions where there's no carbon separating you, you call that ortho, okay, or O. So this is ortho derivative, okay? If you've got one carbon between you, you're called a meta derivative, or M. Okay, so they're ortho, so zero carbons between, meta, one carbon between, and the last one is P or para, and that's two carbons between. So do you guys see why this one's called an orthobenzene? You guys see that? This is a metabenzene, this is a parabenzene. So what would this be? Ortho, meta, or para? Meta. meta. Okay? So it doesn't necessarily mean that you have to have the same groups here and here. Okay? So if I were to ask you, what about these two chlorines here and here? What are they in relation to each other? Ortho. Ortho. Is that cool? Everybody got that? What about those two chlorines? Meta. meta. And what about those two? Para. Okay? So you should be able to do that with any of these things. We'll talk about, I don't know if we'll talk about this one, two, three, four, five naming system. Um, here's some properties of aromatics nonpolar, hydrophobic. Um, a number of vitamins that we need for our everyday living, right? Um, are aromatic compounds. In fact, a uh, very, very extremely high number of biomolecules are aromatic compounds. All of your bases in DNA are aromatics. Um, a lot of your amino acids and proteins are aromatics and a lot of other molecules that are endogenous to the human body are also aromatics. And then we'll talk about these polyaromatics these are just benzene rings stuck to each other. We call them polyaromatics because there's many benzene rings. Okay. Um, so that's uh, so one before you guys leave, if you don't mind. Um, we have we have two classes that we've gone over so far: unsaturated hydrocarbons. These are alkenes, alkynes, and aromatics, and saturated hydrocarbons just the alkanes. So this is the survey of the four different functional groups that we've talked about so far. 
and we'll go on to um, some others later. Thank you, sir. Um, make sure you sign the list before you get out of here. Thank you. It's up here. And um, hopefully I'll be done grading your stuff in a couple hours, okay? If you want to come up to lab for the buffer or the fats lab, I'll be there at 11. Oh, sorry. Oh, uh, so you're going to have to wait until after.